is this video an excuse to read all these fantasy sequels that I want to read? Yes. I have been wanting to know what happens for a while now, so I'm gonna binge. Your girl's gonna binge. Okay, I didn't get that far though. I only got to page 63 yesterday, so I feel like all that's happened so far is I'm just understanding what the plot's gonna be. There hasn't really been any new development. Let me make something clear. This is gonna be spoiler free, but since Majority, no, all of these books are sequels. I'm not gonna spoil anything about this book, but me talking about this book is obviously gonna spoil some of the content in the first installment of this series, The Cruel Prince. So if you have not read The Cruel Prince, I would probably not watch this part of the video. If you have read Cruel Prince and you have not read this book, don't worry, I'm not gonna spoil anything. We're just gonna talk about it. We start off this book where it's, there has been a mini like time jump of five months Months. So it's been five months since the first book ended. Okay, so Cardin's on the throne and Jude pretty much holds all the power, right? Because she made that deal with Cardin in the first book that he has to be under her command for a year and one day. Where we see Jude, like she is a different Jude from the first book already. She has a lot on her plate right now and she is scrambling. She is constantly paranoid that Cardin is gonna find a way to get out from her control. Jude is enjoying this power. I mean, everyone saw that coming from the first book. Jude is scrambling to learn all of the politics of Elfheim, right? Because she's having to make all these big decisions and Cardin is being no help. He is just being reckless, having parties, getting drunk. Jude and Cardin haven't really spoken in the five month time jump. There is just serious tension between Jude and Cardin. It's been a five month time jump, but nothing has changed, which I like. I don't feel like I've missed a bunch. So right now, Jude is just navigating the courts and the politics of the fairy, but she's running herself thin. Already, I'm worried for her, and I'm only 60 pages in. Now, I've, I just got to this part, and I think this is where, this is when the main plot is gonna unfold with this. Jude found out from Nicasia. Nicasia was, she was Cardin, she's Cardin's ex, she was one of the ones that was tormenting Jude and Tarn in school in the first book. Nicasia made it clear to Jude that someone that is close to her that she thinks is her friend has already betrayed her. We don't know how, we don't know what, and we don't know who. That's gonna be the mystery, right, that Jude is gonna try to figure out is who betrayed her and what is gonna come of it. I'm sure we're gonna get some progression and the romance, so I'm sure she'll have to be fighting her complicated feelings for Cardin. I don't know, I have, I'm scared. I'm honestly kind of scared because Holly Black's characters, y'all, and I mentioned this in my previous video, that none of her characters are supposed to be 100% likable, I'm convinced, I'm sticking by that. I just don't think this is gonna end well. Don't, I still don't trust Cardin. I mean, you like him, but he is not a good guy. You can't count on him to do the right thing, and I feel like he's possibly gonna break Jude's heart, and I don't know, He's just a morally gray character, right? So you love him for it. I'm really worried about what's gonna happen with the romance. I just don't think it's gonna go well. So far, it's good. I mean, I'm already sucked in because I made this clear in my previous video as well. I love Jude. I'm obsessed with my girl. I wanna be her best friend. Like, I, she's just a queen. She's a fighter. I'm just gonna say this right now. I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna predict it. Holly Black's gonna break my heart. I haven't looked at any reviews on this book. I haven't really even dived in to see like what exactly the plot is about because I wanna go into this not knowing anything, but I'm predicting Holly Black's gonna break my heart. Let's remember that I said this when I finished the book, okay? So I'm gonna read some more right now. It's a really short book. It's only like 300 pages. If I don't finish this afternoon, I'll probably finish it before bed. Okay, let's read.
Okay, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> I said that like three times. But I think I'm just a little disappointed. There's not any development on the romance. I don't want it to be necessarily a romanticy. Like I know that this isn't that. This is, you know, more of a political fantasy, but there's zero romance. And I think I just wish there was like a tiny bit of romance, like just dabbled in the pages of it, you know? Like, am I speaking too soon? I don't know, but I just want just a little bit of romance tucked into these pages, okay? If you haven't read this book, I'm giving the impression that there's like zilch, zero, which I guess is what I said, but there's like 2% romance, I guess. I mean, there's obviously this unspoken, I guess you could say tension between them, but it's not touched on. And when Cardin and Jude have dialogue, there's not enough. It's like a few sentences. Like, I think I think that's what I want, actually. I think that's what I want. It's just more dialogue between Jude and Cardin. So, update. Yeah, we're getting some romance. I literally just needed to read 15 to 20 more pages and I never would have said what I said before. So I take it back, we're getting some romance and it is, <laughs> it's good, it's checking my boxes. Holly Black was like, I hear you girl. And she gave me what I wanted and I literally just needed to read like 15 more pages. It was so funny. I got about halfway through. I can't stop reading it. I feel like I'm flying through this book and Holly Black just knows how to hold your attention and I, just love that about her writing, giving off the same vibes with Cruel Prince where you're just following Jude, right? And you have no idea what's gonna happen. So I'm nervous, I'm so nervous, but I'm gonna take a break and eat dinner and then hopefully finish it this evening or by tonight before bed. I like wanna hurry up and finish this because I just wanna know everything, but then I know once I finish this series, I'm gonna be so upset, like sad it's over. So I'm trying to just like pace myself and enjoy it. My curiosity is getting the best of me and I just have to know what happens. <laughs> but yeah, Jarden is here and she's here to shine and I'm here for it. I wish I could talk to you about this. <laughs> I'm revived. Okay, here is the plan, girlies, or gents, but I doubt there's any dudes here watching this content. I'm still reeling, okay? I'm still spiraling from last night when I finished The Wicked King. So, <laughs> I just wanna sit down and read The Queen of Nothing right now. I know I haven't given a review or a rating. I'm gonna read a little bit of The Queen of Nothing while I drink my coffee because I just gotta get started, okay? And I have the time to read right now, so I'm just like, I need to read, you know? And then maybe I'll come back with a review of The Wicked King. Do you even care? Maybe not. I just thought I'd give you my play-by-play, -play, okay? Let's go read. Okay, so I just wanna say, if you thought the first book in this series, if you thought that ending was cruel, like you don't even know what's coming with this book. Like Holly Black knew what she was doing. She wanted to cause pain <laughs> and she did. If I had to wait for the release of the following book, The Queen of Nothing, I, ugh, I would hate it. Like I don't even know what I would do. It'd be terrible. It was such a great, juicy, delicious cliffhanger that I ate up but was still screaming. Y'all, I thought I loved Jude in The Cruel Prince. Like I thought I knew the extent of what my girl could do. And I thought that I knew the extent of my love for her. 
this character. Um, no, I was wrong. I love Jude even more after reading this book. She is just such a queen. Y'all, no matter what comes her way, no matter who betrays her, who stabs her in the back, she continues to prevail. She finds the strength to keep going. Oh my gosh, I think her character is just so unique. She will, is by far one of my faves just because of her strength and her relentlessness. Like I am just obsessed with her. I'm in awe of her. Yeah, she's one of my favorite. Cardin continues to surprise me. He surprised me in The Cool Prince and he surprised me in this one. At least for me when I was reading the book, I could never predict what he was gonna do. It's weird because it's like when you finally see what he's doing, when his plans and schemes unfold, it's not necessarily shocking because it lines up with his character, but it's still left me baffled and speechless. He is just such an unpredictable character that makes this book, in my opinion, so much more thrilling. Let me just say that he'll definitely keep you guessing till the very end of this book. <laughs> it's kind of frustrating, but you eat it up at the same time. Like you love it. At least I did. I think him being in this book more than The Cool Print truly made this book shine. I will say this book is 90% just scheming, politics, courts intrigue, and angst. Not a ton happens, but for some reason, it never ceased to entertain me. I don't know what it is, maybe because I never knew what was coming next and because Holly Black kept shocking me and surprising me with every page turn and I don't know, and I don't know why I can never predict what's gonna happen in Holly Black's books, but is it because she's a genius? Or is it just because I am so immersed into the story, y'all, that I don't even stop to play detective? The romance, y'all, there is some progression for sure even though it is tucked in behind betrayal action politics it is truly one of the best enemies to lovers i have ever read like y'all this is how you do enemies to lovers okay this is how you do it Cardin and jude's few romantic interactions had me on the edge of my seat had me swooning begging for more there is so much tension there is so much angst and there it's just a bunch of those moments where they <laughs> they would act on feeling and then they would look at each other and be like oh my gosh what did we just do like they they themselves can't come to terms with how they feel about each other and it is just so entertaining to see it play out because they like they're enemies like they cannot fathom wanting each other i don't okay i don't want to say much more because i just think you need to read it and see it play out but it is just like this is how you write enemies to lovers okay it is so realistic how it plays out between them and it is hilarious and oh my gosh so deliciously good and so it's there y'all jarden is there Jarden is in these pages. I just love Holly's writing, y'all, Holly Black's writing, because she has these one-liners, and if you've read The Cool Print, you know what I'm talking about, where she'll end a chapter with them, and I'm left speechless or with my heart torn in half. Like, I just, she knows how to get me to feel what she wants me to feel, what her characters are feeling. All in all, y'all, this book is filled with so many twists and turns. I think it'll take you on a roller coaster of emotions. I definitely fell in love with this series even more, and I ate every single word that Holly Black fed to me in this book. All I'm gonna say is just prepare yourself because the ending is gonna, it's gonna hurt a little bit. So, uh, but in such a good way, right? My rating for this book, I don't know. I think I need to think on it. I kinda wanna say five star. Whoa, I know. But then a part of me doesn't know it might be like a 4.5 for me because I wished a little bit more would have happened. But then I'm like, I don't know, is that me being too nitpicky? But I do wish we got a little bit more of Cardin. Even if it wasn't, like I'm not even saying I wanted more, more romantic scenes, just more of him in general. I don't know, I just know when I closed the book, I was left wanting more. I wasn't 100% satisfied. As all of Holly Black's books, it's separated into book one and book two. I got to book two, chapter 19, page 167, so I'm more than halfway through. I hate that I have to do stuff this afternoon because it took everything in me to peel myself away from this book. So I'm, I'm planning to finish it tonight before bed. I literally don't wanna do anything but read this book. Anyways, just to talk about what this book is about, this book picks up right where the Wicked King left off. It picks up with Jude in the human mortal world. <laughs> 
living with Vivi. She has no idea how she's gonna make it back to Elfheim. Vivi comes to Jude needing her help, which which requires Jude to go back to Elfheim and carry out what Tarn needs her to do. And I don't wanna say what that is because it would spoil something pretty big that happened. The opportunity has presented itself so now Jude can return to Elfheim. And of course, like that's just no simple thing. One thing leads to the next and now she is seeing that a war is brewing between Maddox and Cardin, which was hinted at at the end of The Wicked King. And so Jude is trying to figure out what she wants to do, like what stance she wants to take who she wants to ally herself with because right now she's not really fond of Maddox or Cardin. So, and of course she's still having to like fight her complicated feelings for Cardin. That's pretty much what is about like this war brewing, Jude back in Elfheim, trying to figure everything out. Like the Wicked King where it's one thing after the next. Like you can't believe you made it from page 20 to 100 so quickly. So because I read the Wicked King and now reading this one, I'm reading them back to back, it feels like one book. Yeah, this book has me laughing out loud with certain, specifically, Cardin. I just think he's so funny. Like his humor is just so dark and dry, but it's just hilarious. My heart was like beating really fast at certain parts because truly I feel like I'm in this world and I'm like rooting for Jude so much that I'm just scared every time some sort of trial comes her way. And every time I think I know what's gonna happen, Holly Black finds a way to tell me, no, girly pop, you don't. Like, you don't know what I'm doing. I just love this world, y'all. It's so good. Nothing like a good fantasy series that sucks you in and makes you forget about your actual life. But there is also nothing like finishing that series and coming back to your life. <laughs> I think this one might have been the best one yet. It's like they just got better and better. Every time I finish a really good series, I'm always like, what am I going to do with my life? Like, what now? I can't believe this is over. Fix these sleeves. They get all puffy on me. So I finished The Queen of Nothing last night, as you saw. I almost wasn't gonna come on here and review because I really don't have much to say. And that's only because what I can say about Holly Black is she was consistent. Every single one of her books gave off the same vibes that I talked about when I reviewed The Wicked King, right? It's like a roller coaster of emotions. There's schemes, there's betrayal, there's politics, there's twists and turns. Nothing is predictable, at least not for me. And you're just immersed into the story right when you start the first page. So with that, I will say that she stayed consistent even with the conclusion. I mean, I was worried that this was gonna be rushed because I felt like we had a lot to go over based off of how The Wicked King ended. And this was only 300 pages, so I was a little worried y'all. But this book did not feel rushed at all. It went at a great pace, the same as Holly Black's first two books in this series. I mean, it had everything that, in my opinion, you want from a fantasy, not a romanticy, a fantasy. And she just delivered with every single book. And so this one had all the same vibes of the other two books. Now, is this the most unique groundbreaking series? No, I mean, there's so many fantasy books about Faye, but I feel like Holly Black truly did make it her own. And it was such a thrilling ride and I was addicted and I binged the series and I couldn't stop. Like once I started reading these books, it was so hard to peel myself away from them. And I truly was immersed in to a story and I can't say that about a lot of books or series that hold my attention and leave me wanting more after each page turn. I just truly, after this book, I was left content and satisfied. Holly Black did the ending well. Ugh, just a fabulous ending. Like the other two books, this book was not predictable. I did not see anything coming and there were, oh, there were some surprises that left me audibly gasping. All in all, y'all, Holly Black's writing touches my heart. Truly, it touches my soul. 
I've never read a fantasy book where I felt like it was so much more than a fantasy that it touched on bigger topics, bigger issues. And I think that if there, I think truly a lot of people can relate to either Cardin or Jude as characters and beautiful what Holly did with her writing because Jude's one-liners or the way, you know, Jude's monologues, they would, I felt like she was peering into my soul and it just felt so personal. And I just love that type of reading experience. And I just could identify so much with Jude throughout all the books and Cardin, oh my gosh. I feel like we saw another side of Cardin in this book that I have been craving throughout the whole series and Holly Black finally delivered and some of Cardin's lines truly broke and healed my heart and um, I just think Holly Black is a beautiful writer. I mean, I'm enchanted with her writing and I just, it makes me want more. So yeah, I'll definitely be reading more of Holly Black. I will be reading Oak's spinoff. Honestly, that's not even because I care about what happens to Oak. I mean, I do, but it's mostly because of Holly Black's writing. Like, I just love it. She's, I think, one of my favorite authors and she created one of my favorite worlds and my one of my favorite love stories ever. I mean, she truly... I mean, I've never read an Enemies to Lovers that felt so real. This one did. I just feel like a lot of Enemies to Lovers, we like to pretend are realistic, but they're not. And this one was. Just seeing Cardin and Jude like finally like slowly peel away their armor to let each other into their hearts was beautiful and I just love it and after all their hurt and pain that, and betrayal that they've endured they still found found a way to make room for each other and it was just just beautiful I love the way Holly Black did it and so I am in awe of this series truly I love the way this series made me feel and I loved being in this world because I you know I really felt like I was in it I mean I can't recommend this series more I mean I know this series isn't for everyone I know that if you're seeking more of a romantic see you know obviously i'm not going to recommend this to you but if you just want like a good series that is going to captivate you and be nothing serious whilst also making you feel something at least um with a thrilling ride that's gonna leave you on the edge of your seat then yeah i would recommend this to you and i just yeah of course now i'm feeling the after effects you know, that we all do after we finish a great series where I'm feeling a little depressed <laughs> because I, it's over and I'm gonna miss Jude more than anybody, truly. I'm gonna miss her so much. My top three, she's definitely in my top three FMCs I've ever read and this series is probably in my top three fantasy series. Yeah, so that's why I don't have much to say because everything that I said about The Wicked King could easily be said about this book as well. Um, I, I need to think on my rating because I always change my mind. I do, I'm, I need a, always like a couple days to think on it. I'm thinking five stars, truly, I am, because I can't think of one thing I didn't like about it. Well, I'll have all my ratings listed at the end of the video and that's not to get you to stay till the end of the video, that's truly because I can't think of one, but I am thinking five stars, I am. I think they got better and better. The first Cruel Prince was four stars for me, and I think Wicked King was 4.5, and this one, I, I'm pretty sure it was a five star. <laughs> I'm sad it's over, but I truly am content and satisfied with the way it ended. Looks like this remind me why I love reading, y'all. I love it. This headband makes me feel really obnoxious, but I don't care because my hair is, it ain't vibing today. <sighs> I'm coming on here to update you and let you know that I've started two twisted crowns. I've made it pretty far. I've got to page 278. I think there's 430 pages. I'm just going to talk to you about the plot really fast because I'm about to go run some errands. And I also, I just don't feel like sharing my thoughts right now because they're not very good. <laughs> but I'm hoping things will take a turn. I'm hoping I'm gonna feel better towards the end, but right now the rating is not looking good. Uh, but pretty much this book, it picks up right where you left off. There's no time jump. We, the author changed it up. It has multiple points of view. We have Raven's point of view. We have Elspeth's point of view, even though it's pretty much just like the nightmare's point of view. And and Elm's point of view. Elm's point of view and Raven's point of view are the new POVs we are getting. Elm's point of view is pretty much all about he, his father now wants him to be heir because of what happened to his brother Hoth, right? He is to be king and to be wed, but he is at the castle and he is forming this, or 
relationship, friendship, romance with Ion, Elspeth's cousin, and they are in search of her maiden card, which she misplaced at Stone. They are searching for that whilst it's mostly just all about their romance, finding the maiden card being the subplot. Raven, he is with the nightmare in Elspeth's body, and they are going to collect the twin Adler's card. Of course, sacrifices and balance must be made to get this Twin Adler's card, but Raven is running out of time because he needs to get it before winter solstice for his brother, and now to save the love of his life, Elspeth. That's pretty much all that is happening. There's the plot, there really isn't much. Um, I think that's why the author added Elm's point of view in this new romance, because Elspeth's point of view, she's, you know, tucked in deep inside her own mind, but you know, the nightmare has taken over. So a lot of her POVs are just the nightmare's point of view, which the only plus about that is we're getting more of the origin story of how the Providence cars were created. I feel like all these questions I had in the first book are finally being answered. And the whole like Providence card thing is super interesting for me. So I'm loving that. And so you're getting the, the Shepherd King's history and like what he himself sacrificed to create these cards and what the consequences were. Really not much of Elspeth, which bothers me a little bit, but we'll go into that later when I'm talking about my review. But yeah, my favorite parts actually so far are Raven's point of view because I just love Raven. I just, he's book boyfriend for me. Let me just say I'm a little disappointed so far. I'm gonna hopefully finish this book later this afternoon and I will give my review and hopefully it'll be better than what I'm thinking right now because I was very excited to read this. I don't wanna be disappointed. I hate when a book disappoints me, but we'll see. And I think I guess the plot twist, which sucks. I hate when a fantasy is predictable. Um, the first one wasn't predictable at all, but I think I guess the plot twist. I will come back later with an update when I finish the book. The mic wasn't on and I was just talking. I finished. Let's talk. Ooh, I have some thoughts and I think they're gonna be unpopular. This was highly rated. Your girl doesn't agree. I had to write down my thoughts in order to make sense of them because I was thinking so many things and a lot of them were good things. And I didn't wanna speak ill of this book and just rant about it. I wanted to have actual structured criticism. I'm honestly so conflicted with the rating. I'm thinking, okay, I'm sitting between a three and a 3.5, but I think I'm gonna say 3.5 five only because I feel I cannot rate this book on its own merits because it is part of a series right so that means it is one story split into parts so I feel my rating needs to also be based off of how I felt when I read one dark window and I loved one dark window that was a 4.5 so I think I'm gonna say 3.5 for the sake of my love of one dark window so I just want to make I just want to make it clear that I was so excited to read this book and I had high expectations and they were met in some ways. This wasn't a flop, okay? But it wasn't without faults and there were too many things I disliked about the book to give it even a four star rating. Like I cannot muster up a four star as much as I, as much as I wish I could. Before I start sharing my thoughts, I also want to make it clear that when I review books, a big part of my rating is based on how the book made me feel. Okay. Yes. I tried to include, you know, characters and the structure of the book and the theme. If I'm honest, it mostly has to do with how it makes me feel because I read to feel or I read to escape feeling. You know what I mean? A lot, a big part of my rating for this book is how it made me feel, you know, and that's when it becomes matter of opinion. One Dark Window is about Raven and Elspeth's story, right? Mostly centered around Elspeth because she's telling her story, but a big part of it is Raven. He's RMMC. And so you would think after finishing One Dark Window and starting Two Twisted Crowns, we would continue following the story of Raven and Elspeth, and they would be the main focus like they were in One Dark Window. Well, yes, we continued to follow their story. We got Raven's POV chapters. He did play a big part in this book as well, but I feel 
majority of the light was shined on Elm and Ion. They were our main characters in this book and we were following their story and their healing journey. Now, nevertheless, it was beautiful and I loved Elm in the first book so I was pleased to see that we were getting his point of view in this book. But I do feel that Raven and Elspeth were screwed. I fell in love with One Dark Window, not just because of the freaking unique creative premise, but also because of my love for the characters Elspeth and Raven, and just seeing these two broken souls come together and find love in ways they never could get from others. I was excited to continue to watch their journey together and watch it unfold, and I was so excited to see that's not what I got at all. I got two other character story and not much of Raven and Elspeth. Another thing is that this was no longer just Elspeth's story. Elspeth and Nightmare had become so intertwined, right, how One Dark Window ended, that this now became not Elspeth's story, but the Nightmare story, which I kind of saw coming. I didn't think that would happen for the whole book, and I was a little disappointed because one thing I still wanted after finishing One Dark Window was to know more about Elspeth. She was always very mysterious, and I felt like we were slowly peeling back her layers with Raven and learning more about her. And I, I was excited to uncover more truths about her and just get to know her at her core, you know? Get to know her aside from the nightmare, like who is Elspeth? And we did not get that. I was so excited to get some more romance from Raven and Elspeth. Not a lot more because I know that this I feel, based off of how One Dark Window went, that this was more of just a fantasy and not a romanticy. But I was excited to get more of Raven and Elspeth's romance and see, you know, what that looked like, how the relationship grew. Not only did we not get that at all, but you barely got any interaction between Raven and Elspeth. There was just not a whole lot of interacting between Raven and Elspeth without the veil of the nightmare over them. It was the Ion and Elm show. Don't get me wrong, I liked Elm, I liked Ion. This has nothing to do with them as characters, okay? You know, I think Elm's healing journey was truly beautiful and I think what Ion brought to the story with her journey with the Maiden card could produce a great conversation about image and politics and some feminist goodness. I truly have no problem with shifting the focus, okay? I understand with the way One Dark Window ended that we needed some other POVs to compensate, right? For the, the gaps of Elspeth's POV. But my issue is when you leave other people's stories unfinished. There is a coda between Elspeth and Raven, okay? But it is merely sentences compared to Ion and Elm's paragraphs. But it was confusing as a reader because I felt that there was unfinished business knowing that these characters wouldn't be in this situation if it were not for Elspeth and the Nightmare. I know, this sounds very, very critical and I'm doing my best not to sound negative, especially for how much I raved about One Dark Window in my previous reading vlog. You know, that is why I'm not giving this like three stars or 2.5 stars, y'all, because I feel like that would just be unfair to this book unfair to the story and the series as a whole. Honestly, this book felt like two books in one. Two separate stories in one book that finally came together for the last part of the book, which was just like 40 pages. And so I just felt that me as a reader, I was clinging to the small bits of Raven and Elspeth that I was getting and it honestly just like fell through the cracks and didn't even come through. And I'm sorry y'all, but I have to say it. I just don't don't think Ion and Elm's story, despite being as engaging as it was, it, in my opinion, had no effect on the plot. I feel like we could have shortened their story a good 75% and still gotten the same effect and the same ending. Their story could have easily just been a novella in between these two books, and then this book could have been cut down at least 150 pages. I just felt Elm and Ion's story just really had no major impact on driving the plot forward, and that's not saying that their story wasn't beautiful in itself. I'm just left with the feeling that the author made a conscious decision and make this second book all about romance. And since she could not do that with Raven and Elspeth based on how One Dark Window ended, she had to compensate and do this whole other romance story between Elm and Ion, which I felt was kind of confusing in itself because the first book wasn't even super romance heavy. It was all, it was a big part of One Dark Window was about 
not just Elspeth's relationship with Raven, but her relationship with the nightmare. All of a sudden, this became a romanticy. This felt like a romanticy. We get so much more romance between Ion and Elm than we ever did with Raven and Elspeth, which is a bit unsettling since Raven and Elspeth are our main characters. Despite finishing this series, I feel I don't know Elspeth any better. Usually when you finish a series, especially a fantasy series, you feel like you know the characters and you feel like they're real, you know? And with Elspeth, I feel like I don't know her and she is our lead. She is the girl on the cover of both books. Do you get my frustration? Funny here is that the blurb on the back of the book, or if you look up the plot of the book on Google, it talks solely about Raven and Elspeth, but we see so little of Elspeth, y'all. So little of her. It's like she disappeared and not much of Raven. And unfortunately, all of Raven's POVs are just him interacting with the nightmare in Elspeth's body, not Elspeth. So just given the way one dark window ended. It's just, it was a shock for me as a reader. Spend all my time in this book watching Elm and Ion just dance around each other. And it's just crazy to me how the most prominent romantic relationship in this series is not the two main characters that are driving the plot forward. And honestly, I missed Elspeth throughout this whole book. I missed her. I felt like she was leading the story in the first book and then in this book, she just felt like a side character or like a co-pilot to her own story. I knew and I figured that Elm and Ion would have a more prominent role in this series, I just did not think that they would be the focus. And so, yeah, it left me disappointed and honestly a bit frustrated. And I hate that. I don't want to leave this series feeling frustrated, but honestly, I'm left looking at this series with a bad taste in my mouth. I loved One Dark Window, where I almost wanted to give it five stars because I could see myself reading it again. But after this book, I have no desire to reread this series. There is supposed to be a big twist. Okay, and I mentioned that I felt that I predicted it early on in reading this book, and I did. It was so predictable. There was no shocking factor in this book. Nothing surprised me. There were no twists and turns, and I just hate when a fantasy feels predictable. The first book didn't feel predictable for me, but this one did. Also, I was very disappointed with the epilogue. I think the author was trying to give us some sort of closure between Raven and Elspeth, but how can I say this without spoiling? It just felt inadequate. So after all of that, I just wanna talk about some things that I did like about this book because it wasn't a one star. It's, it, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I, and I don't wanna end this on a negative note, okay? One, I liked the nightmare. I think he's a great character. I think he's funny. He made me laugh out loud. How he would mess with Raven was so funny. The nightmare is just observations and his side commentary was just laugh out loud funny. So it was nice to get that report Reprieve, you know that laughing reprieve the next thing that I loved about this book was learning the origin story of the Providence cards I mentioned that earlier when I was talking to you about the plot. I just am obsessed with the premise of this book I think it is just so unique and so creative and truly is nothing like it And that's why I fell in love with this series, you know the vibes that these books give give off are just Chef's kiss that I loved and I felt like I got you know my questions answered about the Providence card and about this magic system And so I feel finally that everything makes sense with that with the, the magic system in this book I am left satisfied. I, I'm seeing so much love for Elm Okay, and I totally get it But we cannot overlook Raven our MMC our husband from the very beginning. Okay, he is he shined in this book I loved him even more. I mean get you a man that is going to go to the ends of the earth to save you Okay, he went to alt alternate realities to save his girl. I love him I loved him from the first book when I first met him and I my love for him just continued to grow and I just think he is top tier one of my favorite character and honestly probably one of my book boyfriends now you know I don't want to have too much influence on anyone's opinion for this book and if you enjoyed this series as a whole and you enjoyed this book then I just love that for you you know truly and I, I mean that because I enjoy books that other people probably do not enjoy I just I'm, I'm just hoping I'm not coming off too negative I just I think one dark window is still a masterpiece and I love it and I think that is you know how you write a fantasy okay that one is how you write a fantasy um, but yeah this one just fell short for me and I honestly feeling a little salty <laughs> a little disappointed
hopefully the lighting isn't too poor but i didn't feel like moving i started six scorch roses this is the novella following the serpent and the wings of night this is tucked in between the first book in the crown of nixia series right before the last book in the series which i forgot the title of it and this book follows lilith and Vale, and lilith and Vale are two characters that are going to come into the picture in the next book they're gonna i think be big characters anyway so this is about their story and how they met so lilith is human Vale is a rishon vampire in lilith's town where she lives everyone is dying everyone is withering away and turning into dust because of some illness that has been cast upon their town by their god and so Lilith is in search for a cure because her sister is withering away so she makes a deal with Vale get his blood for six months in exchange for six roses so she goes to Vale once a month retrieves a few vials of his blood that she wants to use because she believes Vale's blood is the key to the cure for this illness and in return she gives Vale these roses one rose for each month so he gets a total of six roses six scorched roses something about the roses like there's magic in them or something but Lilith hasn't told us as the reader or veil what type of magic those roses harbor but from what I can tell so far they never die what I will say so far it's a novella right so it's only like 180 pages once I started this book I couldn't put it down one thing I'll say about Carissa Broadbent this is how I felt with the serpent in the wings of night her writing is really easy to understand despite her world being a sort of like complex political system she makes it easy for the reader to digest i find myself never being confused when it comes to her writing and i love that what i can say so far is that this one is very 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 romance heavy i would say it's more of a romance focused plot it's not very action-packed like the serpent in the wings of night the romance is supposed to carry the story these characters are supposed to carry the story it's predictable it's you know it's got those typical romance romantic cliche scenarios it's keeping my interest i'm gonna finish this book and then i'll come back with a review It's so dark in my house today because it's raining and so I honestly don't know where to film and I was trying to find the best lighting for the longest time and it's just not gonna happen today. But I finished Thick Scorched Roses and so let's talk. I haven't read a lot of novellas, honestly. I think the only other novella I've read is the one that is in the Akotar series. What is it called? Frost and Starlight. And I don't know how to rate novellas. I just feel like I, I, I don't know how to rate them because I feel like they need to be on a different rating scale than book. What is that scale? I don't know. Maybe it's something I need to like take the time to look into. Your girl don't know how to do it. I don't even think I ever rated Frost and Starlight because I didn't know how to. <laughs> So I guess if I had to rate this, I don't know, 3.5. And like, if I read more novellas in the future, will I think back and be like, wow, this was a good novella. Maybe I should have given it like four stars, <laughs> 4.5. I don't know, but I'm thinking 3.5. Let me just share my thoughts and then we can just leave it at that. I don't know if this will be something that others would disagree with, but I feel like this kind of felt like a book and because of the characters, the characters felt really fleshed out. I got connected with them and I fell in love with them in just 180 pages. Like, I really like them. I'm excited to see more of them. Like, I'm so glad I read this. I really am. I, I mean, I think you could read this as a standalone. I think you could, if you didn't want to dive into The Serpent and the Wings of Night, because maybe you just wanted to get a taste of this world, you didn't want to read that 500 page book. I think you could read this first and then decide from there if the little glimpse of this world that you get, if you like it or not. And if you fall in love with this world, you will love the world of The Serpent and the Wings of Night. So yeah, I really like this world, so it was nice to be in it, but to see a different side of it with different characters that are very different than the characters in The Serpent of the Wings of Night. I like that they felt different. 
I like that this didn't feel like a repeat. I think the sickness that was brought on to this world by the curse made for a really good plot. It was interesting and I was flipping the pages because I wanted to see like how this was all gonna unravel. I thought the romance was so pure. I really liked this romance. I liked that it started off with an unlikely friendship. You look at these characters and you're like, wow, like y'all are kind of perfect for each other. Like they just work. I liked them a lot. I feel like Lilith made a really good FMC. I liked her more than I thought I was going to. I feel like she feels very different than a lot of FMCs you read about in fantasy. I, I feel like characters in fantasies can start to just like blend into each other. They start to all feel it's the same. Um, so I'm always impressed when an author can make a character in a fantasy stand out. And I feel like Lilith stands out. I feel like I, I will remember her. And I don't know if that's because she's a scientist, like that background, or if it's how she struggles to connect with people. I don't know what it is, but I liked her and it was very entertaining to read from her point of view. And then Vale, our MMC, I think that he was very interesting. I wish we would have gotten to know more of him. I felt like there is still so much about him that I don't know. And so that honestly goes into something that I didn't like about it. I don't know if it's because the author just wanted to keep it short, but I mean, this could have been like at least 50 pages longer and we could have gotten to know a little bit more about Vale and his background. Like for instance, there's this girl that he's with in the beginning, not like with romantically, well, <laughs> We don't know. And she like pops up and then we, she's never mentioned again. She's never seen ever again in the story, which is fine. Like it didn't necessarily like affect the story greatly, but it just would have been nice to know like who was she to Vale? I still don't know who she is. Like I don't know what her purpose was. And I just feel like we could have spent time to go into that and then probably gotten to know Vale and how he was living his life before Lilith came into it. And so stuff like that. Like I feel like there were certain things in the story that I felt were brushed over and left me with questions. I will say this was very predictable and there were a few, few cheesy parts. Like there were a couple parts where I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure I've read this sort of dialogue before in a fantasy. I still enjoyed it. I was still entertained. I still couldn't put the book down. I mean, once I started it, I didn't want to stop. Yeah, Carissa Broadbent like knows how to keep my attention. And like I said before, she knows how to make me excited to read and so any author that gives me that I will love and I will pick up any book that they write nothing groundbreaking but I had such a great time and truly I said this before about the serpent in the wings of night but if you loved Akotar and you would give that series five stars you will love this series like this series is for you so yeah this made me excited to read the next book in the series more excited than I was after I finished *The Serpent in the Wings at Night*. And I think that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching to the end if you did. Thank you for being here if you're here. I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>